excited to welcome you back to the second part of the 51st Board of Governors meeting of Ben Gurion University of the Negev. The opening video of our last session touched upon some of the fundamental aspirations of the man sitting opposite me, Professor Daniel Shamovitz. As the president of BGU, he presented us with the outstanding achievements of this remarkable university, achievements that were all somehow accomplished even amidst a global pandemic. Now, in this session, we plan to explore Ben Gurion University's long-term vision. We're going to meet some of the brightest and the most exciting researchers on campus. We'll hear from our students, and we'll even enjoy a few surprises in what I promise will be a gripping 60 minutes. Now, Danny, I know that you're passionately dedicated to innovative research and, of course, creating real solutions that will improve people's lives. So can you expand on this for us and what you're doing to make that happen? Yeah, well, I think, I hate to keep harping on the COVID crisis, but I think how we functioned over the past year really exemplifies what is great about BGU and how we do our research. So almost a year and a month ago, with this pandemic, you know, hitting us, mm -hmm. um, I called on the researchers of Ben Gurion University to put their research aside and to come to my office and to present me ways that we can work together to find solutions. And the next day, over 60 researchers showed up in that room. We did a mini hackathon for about three hours. And within three weeks, we had funded over 24 projects in all faculties, different types of mixings of people from different disciplines. And these groups yielded eight patents, four companies, and really research that affected things from communications to virology to uh, diagnostics and to just help keeping both our country and the world safe. And so what we see here is that when we get rid of the silos that really divide disciplines and take a problem-based approach, mm -hmm. we can really use all the wonderful things of academic research to solve some of the world's greatest problems. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting because we're going to speak more about innovation right now. I'd actually like to turn to a short clip introducing Dr. Shelley Levit Sedek from BGU's Department of Physical Therapy. Dr. Levit Sedek runs the university's Cognition, Aging, and Rehabilitation Lab, and she's designed gamified social robots that help stroke patients recover and manage pain. Just take a look at this. What if you had suffered a stroke and had difficulty buttoning your own shirt? Or your doctor tells you you need to do exercises to ease your pain, but you never follow through, right? What if you had a robot help you with these exercises at home? People who've had a stroke often lose the ability to perform everyday activities. Something like pouring yourself a glass of water may become an extremely difficult task, one which you have to practice over and over again thousands of times to do well. Some of this practice is done in the clinic with a physical therapist, but the majority of the practice needs to be done by the patient on their own at home. And the reality is that people don't practice enough, and that can be for a variety of reasons. Practicing the same action over and over again may be boring, frustrating, painful, and they may be worried they're not exercising correctly since they receive no feedback. We designed a robotic system that helps people do this exercise on their own. The system is fully sensorized so patients can get feedback as they practice various actions. For example, grabbing a jar of coffee, lifting it and placing it on a shelf. Another problem for stroke patients is that they often use compensatory movements, such as bending their torso instead of reaching with their arm because they can't straighten it. So we also built a machine learning algorithm to alert patients when they use compensatory movements, which we want them to avoid. So we're using artificial intelligence and social robotics to help people practice within the limited window of opportunity following a stroke in which it is crucial that they practice as much as possible. My research team just started analyzing the data from our experiment and we're seeing that 90% of those who practiced with a robot over a five-week period showed improvement in their clinical scores as opposed to none of those who only received the standard treatment. This is the first experiment in the world to test how such a robotic system can help patients in the long term. 
The beauty of working at BGU is that I can work on this with people from a variety of fields, including psychology, engineering, and healthcare. BGU supports this in a variety of ways, including dedicated grants and a robotics initiative. In this way, we're creating a future in which people can maintain their independence and their dignity. All right, now I'd like to turn back to you, Danny. Um, Dr. Levy Tzedek emphasized how her research involves people from multiple fields, and not only her Department of Physical Therapy. Is her approach unique within the BGU system? Definitely not. I want to give an example that no one's heard of yet, which really exemplifies how this interdisciplinary approach can work. So everyone knows that Ben-Gurion University of the Negev houses David Ben-Gurion's archives. Right. All of his diaries, all of his handwritten diaries. Yes. And one of our challenges is how to make his diaries accessible to the world. Now, we all know about digitizing printed text, and Google does that wonderfully. But how can we digitize David Ben-Gurion's handwriting? This is a major technological, computational problem. Right. Now, it ends up by chance at Ben-Gurion University, we have one of the world's experts in deciphering difficult handwriting. And that's Professor Giada Sana the world's first Bedouin professor of computer science, who used to be the head of the Department of Computer Science. And so now we have Professor Asana, who is using his expertise to write algorithms, which are going to help us decipher David Ben-Gurion's handwriting so that his archives can be available to the world, accessible to the world, and then for the research of researchers around the world. So we have computer science and history, um, Zionist history, coming together a Bedouin and Jewish researchers only at Ben-Gurion University. Oh, it's extremely, extremely exciting. You know, how critical is such an approach for making important discoveries? You know, or are there other examples within BGU, of course, of such interdisciplinary research? I could just go on forever about this. Um, how much time do we have? We... So earlier... You have enough time. So earlier in the program today, I talked about the new um, donation from the Israeli Foundation, right. founding the Israeli National Autism Research Center. And what do we have here? Why did Ben-Gurion get this donation? Why were we chosen to have the uh, National Autism Research Center? Because we're the only place in Israel where a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a computer scientist, a geneticist are within what I call coffee distance, where they can get together a five-minute walk between Soroka and the university, between the different departments, drink coffee, and come up with fascinating new ideas on how to study autism. And this is really at the DNA of the Ben-Gurion University ex uh, experience, this idea that everyone can get together, that everyone's on the same area right. to make amazing, amazing um, discoveries. Right, and you mentioned that that was what was essential in taking on the coronavirus pandemic, right? Exactly. The beginning of the Exactly. Pandemic. We, you know, people from public health, we had people from social work, people from engineering, people from computer mm -hmm. science all coming together to understand what can we do to make that next big discovery. We're not, I mean, one of our challenges as a university moving forward is how to go from a discipline-based university, which is what most universities are, right. to a problem-based university, and really realizing that these definitions of existing expertise are really artificial, right. but that all of us together can really do the next great thing. Absolutely. It's about interconnectivity, right? Bringing people together to find these yes. solutions. All right. So it's amazing to hear about these accomplishments. Now, we have another exciting video for everyone. This time, we're actually introducing assistant professor and lecturer Ori Beck, who specializes in the philosophy of perception, the mind, and epistemology. Take a look. I work in the philosophy of mind. I focus on trying to put together what the cognitive sciences are telling us about how the brain works with our immediate understanding of ourselves as creatures that sense, think, and know about the world around us. On the one hand, strong arguments based on current results in the cognitive sciences suggest that our experiences are determined by what goes on inside our brains. That means that even if you were nothing but a lonely brain floating around in an empty universe, so long as that brain worked as it does now, you would have the same experiences as you do now. 
On the other hand, experiences make us aware of things outside our brains. For example, when you hear your daughter call out to you, you become aware of the needs of another person, not of neurons firing inside your head. And similarly, when you experience the sun, you become aware of a star that's 150 million kilometers away, not of a neurotransmitter in your synapses. It is difficult to understand how experience could be both determined by what goes on inside our brains, and also make us aware of things outside our brains. For example, how can I know that the sun is setting on the basis of my experience if I could have that same experience without ever seeing the sun? In my research, I focus on understanding how scientific discoveries about the brain can be reconciled with the idea that we can experience the outside world. To that end, it's crucial that I keep up to date with both new cognitive research and ongoing developments in philosophical thought. The end goal is to marry cognitive science and philosophy in a way that helps us understand the mind's place in the physical world. Philosophy is a lonely field. Most of what I do is sit, read, and write alone. Luckily, knowledge often involves collaboration with others. This includes picking the brains of my psychology colleagues and getting my students to understand both the physics and the metaphysics of the mind. mind-blowing. That's it's very impressive. Now, Danny, after listening to Dr. Beck, I'm curious as to how you see the futures of the fields of philosophy and humanities in Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Well, I think that Ori's presentation really highlights what the future of the humanities can and maybe should be. We sort of tend to think of the humanities completely isolated, off in their own little corner, in their own part of the library, sort of separated from the technological parts of the university. Interesting. But as we move on, as science you know, uh, moves forward, we're seeing again and again and again that there is no separation. Now, that's also a very artificial separation. When someone gets their doctorate, what is a PhD? It's a doctor of philosophy. Right. That's, you know, scientists True. used to be considered philosophers. You, were getting, you don't get a doctor of science, it's a doctor of philosophy. And so, Uli is showing the importance of psychologists understanding the basis of philosophy for what they're doing, and also how it's important for philosophers to really understand the science of what's going around. And we're seeing this in many fields within the humanities. For example, within our new School of Sustainability and Climate Change, which we heard about earlier, archaeology is part of this. What's the connection between archaeology and climate change? Right. It's because our archaeologists have shown that three and 4,000 years ago, there are cities, communities within Israel, which were destroyed or abandoned because of changes of climate, because of changes of food availability. So when we integrate the humanities, when we integrate history with our science, then we get the best of both worlds. And if we can sell it that way, if we can develop it this way, the university will just go Blind Absolutely, forward. and I think that students, that's what they want. They want the ability to be able to learn in all of these different fields, not just that one course track, exactly. you know? Exactly, and that, this is one of our challenges moving forward, is this integration and showing the relevance of the humanities for all of what we're studying. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Now, I, I'd like to actually talk about the heart of the university community, which is ultimately students, right? Um, you aim to provide them with not only top class education, but also the understanding that commitment to community is key here. Um, and when you first arrived to Ben Gurion University, I heard this very fun fact that you spent quite a lot of time just walking out and about on campus and trying to get to know the students, you know, ask them questions. Why was this so important to you? Well, first of all, as a newcomer to the university, it was clear to me that I had to get a feel for what the university is. And at its core, as you said, the university is the students. Second of all, as a teacher, more overall, that's what I am. I'm a teacher. Right. Even as I'm doing my research, I'm teaching. When I'm teaching my classes, I'm you know, interacting with the students. And often in my office, in the presidential office, I'm missing that interaction. I no longer have a class of 300 students that I teach twice a day. Right. So it was critical for me to find the students, to understand what they're passionate about. I would probably scare the, 
whatever, something, because I would actually go to Aroma and randomly sit down at a table and start talking to students. They would not, they, of course, who recognized the president? Then I would tell them I was the president, and there'd be this look of shock on their face, right. and you know. But then after a little while, they would, you know, really tell me what they felt about the university. And that's what I've missed over the past year. You can't do a random Zoom with students. You don't have those random meetings. Right, right. So I'm really looking forward to them coming back to campus um, this month. Well, it's also just so essential in understanding what is happening on the ground, what students want the most out of the university and out of these courses that they're being provided. Well, well it's also a little egoistical. I know, I mean, yeah, it's important yeah. for me to understand what they want, but yeah. I feed off of their energy, and that gives me the energies to continue on as president. Yeah, you make me miss university. I want to go back to university now. Well, Ben-Gurion is waiting for you. Yeah, that's, that's the next step. There you go. All right, Danny. Now, some of you may have heard of Hillel. After all, it is the largest Jewish campus organization in the world with thousands of college students globally. But Hillel is on a mission to provide Jewish students with a stronger sense of identity and community as they pursue a higher education. And they're not only existing on campuses outside of Israel. In fact, there is Hillel at Ben-Gurion University as well, so let's get to know some of their students. and Hello started a while ago. Uh, my name is Imbar Reshef. I study mechanical engineering. אני שנה שלישית בתואר בפוליטיקה וממשל ותקשורת. בערך מגיל תיכון ידעתי שאני רוצה להתעסק בתחומים של יהדות תפוצות, משרד החוץ, דיפלומטיה. אוהב בשביל להיחשף לאיך היו היהודים במדינות במזרח אירופה. The reason I keep coming back to Ben Gurion, I did my MBA here as well, is I really believe the values the university promotes. If it's a liberal view, a different view, then I'm very, very proud of it. And that's why I wanted to take part in the community and to take part in the community. Ben Gurion, I think that at least in my class, I'm very proud of our social and social support. The teachers, also the students, it was always a place to take part in some kind of activity דרישות אקדמאיות. נחשפנו לאישה שהיא ניצולת שואה בבלרוס. היא פשוט סיפרה לנו את כל מה שהיא עברה. 80 אנשים ישבו בחדר והרגישו את כל מה שהיא הרגישה. וזה מבחינתי היה נקודת תפנית כזאת שהבנתי ש... אנחנו לא עושים מספיק. ומאוד עניין אותי תמיד כל מה שהוא מעבר ליהדות כדת. יהדות כתרבות, יהדות כמסורת. ובהלל מצאתי את זה, מצאתי את המקום הזה להתייחס ליהדות מעבר לדת משלוש דתות. כל עולם, I think it's something, some term that really allows everyone to connect to it differently. לעשות את העולם קצת יותר טוב ממה שהוא היה לפניי. אם זה למען הסטודנטים, אם זה למען ניצולי שואה, אם זה למען היהודים בתפוצות. They can see what they want to change in the world, what they want to make better, and through that action to make it happen. You have a chance to have a discussion, and some kind of a discussion. Um, and I think that's what I love most about it. Having something that joins us all together. understand what you were saying about community spirit at Ben Gurion University. So, you know, I know along with being a scientist, you're also a musician and you're the author of a very popular book. So can you share, you know, with us a little bit about why these activities are also so important to you? I think when you look at academics in general, while there might be this idea of two-dimensionality, almost all academics I know have interests outside of their own field. Um, 
a lot of my students were shocked to know that it wasn't until I was 31 years old that I had any idea that I would actually be a professor. I didn't actually didn't think I was talented enough to be a scientist. Um, wow. And so I've always played guitar. I wrote a book. Writing is important to me. And it's this creativeness outside of the academia, which I think plays off of the creation that we do within academia. Research is an incredibly creative endeavor. Right. It's creating something from nothing. Nothing can be more creative than that. Um, and I think as we'll see, you know, when we're talking with some of our young scientists, that they all have interests outside of what they're doing. And it's critical for keeping us balanced. And I think it makes us more creative in our own professional endeavors. Oh, I absolutely agree. I remember when I was in university, I did a million after school activities, you could say, just because, you know, you want something else to kind of give you that creative drive when you go back to the books. Exactly. exactly. All right. So. We're going to go now meet two other special researchers who have been recruited recently. And speaking of hobbies, Danny, Dr. Shira Chapman is not only a physicist, she's also a violinist. And Dr. Ben Palmer is a chemist who also happens to be a keen rugby fan. Let's say hello. We've all heard about black holes. Perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, Black holes are this very massive and dense object, so dense that even light cannot escape. We would like to understand what happens to the laws of physics deep inside a black hole. The colors of chameleons, the visual system of scallops, the brilliant colors of butterflies, many of nature's most amazing optical phenomena are produced by the reflection of light from crystals. How can we learn from these systems to produce the next generation of optical materials for us? Black holes are a good testing ground for gravity under extreme conditions. In my research, I discovered that the physics of black holes is deeply connected to the physics of quantum systems. Quantum systems are entangled. That means that different particles influence each other's state instantaneously, a kind of spooky action at a distance. The relation of black holes and quantum systems is very surprising. We have two completely different physical systems which are described by the exact same rules. This relation helps us study the physics inside black holes, but also the other way around. We can use the tools of gravity to build better quantum computers. Quantum computers use the principle of superposition, the fact that particles can be at different states at the same time to perform computation in parallel on different inputs. This holds a great promise to accelerate significantly tasks such as deciphering of encryption. On a day-to-day -day basis, I study Einstein's equation to understand how black holes are influenced by objects thrown into them, and I run simulations of quantum systems to see how the two are related. We are now discussing a collaboration with ELTA, the radar division of the Israel Aerospace Industries, to construct the first Israeli quantum computer. Many optical effects involved in coloration and vision in animals are produced by the reflection of light from crystals. Animals exquisitely control the crystallization of simple organic molecules to make these highly functional optical materials. But nothing is known about how they do this. For the first time, my lab is trying to unveil the tricks that animals use to control the formation of these materials, which are far beyond the state of the art in chemistry. To do this, we follow the formation of crystalline materials in model organisms undergoing development, such as in shrimp, spiders, and lizards that can all be found here in the Negev and Elat. We use a new cryo-electron microscope in the nanocenter, which is the most advanced system of its kind in Israel. A particularly exciting goal is to uncover the genes controlling the formation of these materials. Understanding this would open the door to using the tools of molecular biology to genetically engineer new optical materials. Sierra, congratulations on being a presidential recruit. Well, thanks a lot. Congratulations to you too. Thank you. So, so what makes BGU special to you? Well, actually for me, BGU is all about connections. I have really amazing collaborations within the physics department. I established a connection with the municipality of Ber Sheva with a program that arranges public scientific talks for the community. And I even play in the Ben Gurion University Chamber Music Ensemble. What about you? Why did you come to BGU? 
So I came for a thriving and ambitious chemistry department and also the university's commitment to establishing a top microscopy facility uh, in the Nano Center. And also here in Besheva, we're perfectly placed geographically to explore the amazing world of animal optics in the desert of the Negev and in the Gulf of Elat. All right, now, Danny, recruiting these two obviously super intelligent and, of course, young researchers is really central to your strategy for the university. So why is this so important to you? And, of course, what is the role of philanthropy in this? Uh, thanks for the question, Natasha. You know, these, I mean, Shira and Ben, I was personally involved in making sure they came to Ben Gurion University and not to any other university in Israel. Because once I met them, once I talked to them, it was clear that they are so outstanding so brilliant that the reputations they make will then increase our reputation as Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And as I've said so many times in the past, the greater our reputation, the more our ability to influence not only the Negev, but also the entire world. So it's essential that if we want to move forward in our next 50 years to become the leading university in Israel, and one of the leading universities in the world, we need Shira, we need Ben, and we need hundreds or tens more like them. Yeah. The problem is that building laboratories for these people, for these real geniuses, is an expensive endeavor. Ben's laboratory, for example, was well over a million dollars and actually reached over $2 million. You know, and this is where the help of our friends is essential. It, convincing these scientists, these young Israelis, to build their futures at Ben Gurion University and not at any other university in Israel. And that's why we've established this new, you saw that they each were called a presidential recruit with the name of the philanthropist, with the name of our supporter who supported them, to show that this is so essential for our future. Yeah, it's a platform for developing not only the future, but the groundbreaking research that will provide solutions to some of the issues that we're dealing with today, like the coronavirus right. pandemic, right? right? And it's actually so that it's our supporters yeah. that have a hand in bringing these scientists back to Israel from abroad. They're, they're going against, their, it's sort of like this philanthropy right. is not only helping Ben Gurion University, it's reversing the brain drain. Interesting, bringing back some of the strongest minds that have now sought work abroad to the state of Israel. Exactly. Very important. All right, well, speaking of which, it is now time for a surprise guest appearance. We were talking about a lot of surprises. Here it is for you. One of Israel's lead singers, songwriters, and musicians is now joining us. He's famous for his unique Masada Sunrise performance, and he wrote the music and recorded the famous Yonatan Geffen song, Yetov. Now, if you haven't already guessed who I'm talking about, let's go straight to his home and say, hi, David Broza. How are you? Hello everybody, shalom lekulam. It's an honor and a pleasure, kavod gadol, to appear before you, members of the board, governors of Ben Gurion University in the Negev. Hello Danny, and how are you? I know it's been hard and um, all these past months have been hard for everybody. But well, I chose a song that is probably um, belongs to the Negev Shira Va Bedoui, Bedouin love song. It goes like this. <laughs> I'm 
I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did playing it, and I hope to see you very soon at the university. Come and visit you all and visit the students and talk about life and continuing with music and exploration. All the best. Toda David Broza, it was such a pleasure to have you with us. Now, we're nearing the end of our board meeting. A month ago, the university announced an exciting plan to establish Israel's first school of sustainability and climate change. Now, Danny, this seems to be an opportunity to present an opportunity to harness BGU's already remarkable work in this field. Can you say a few words about this? Sure. Yeah, as I presented last year at the Board of Governors meeting, when we were doing the strategic planning, sustainability and climate change was identified as an unrealized strength of the university. And so we spent the past year trying to understand what can we do to get people from various fields, or what I called silos earlier, to collaborate, to cooperate for the good of humanity. It's clear, I think, to all of us as the pandemic is subsiding that climate change is the greatest threat to our future and that behooves us all to really um, come together to find solutions, to learn how to live in an increasingly warming environment. Now, what have we been doing at Ben Gurion University for the past 50 years? We learned how to live in the desert. 
Right. Right. Ben Gurion said something like that: scientists and researchers will sit at the gates of the of the Negev, learn how, uh, find its uh, secrets, learn how to make energy from the sun, um, water from the air, and food from the sands. I'm paraphrasing a bit, because of course it was in Hebrew. That's fair. Well, these were we thought were local problems of the Negev, but were once were local problems. It's now a global imperative. It's probably not shocking to find out that people from the United Arab Emirates, from Abu Dhabi and Dubai, from Morocco, are coming to Be to Be'er Sheva, to Stable Care, to Ben Gurion University of the Negev, to learn from our expertise. Right. But sustainability and climate change is not only about technology, it's not only about engineering, it's learning how to live as a society, it's learning how to change economic models, it's learning about health, and so it's this really super disciplinary approach that only at Ben Gurion University we have over 100, close to 150 researchers in this field, that we really are going to become the place in Israel and among the leaders of the world within this field. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating. And, you know, on this note, in the spirit of this topic, I want to introduce you to Professor Itzik Mizrahi, who will talk to us about his research and how it can possibly prevent global warming. Did you know that microbial communities are everywhere and drive basic processes in our everyday life? From the air that we breathe to the food that we eat. For example, communities of microbes, yes, microbes live in communities, decompose plants and our bodies when we die into carbon dioxide and transform it back into the very basic building blocks of life, enabling the renewal of our next generation. For me, microbes represent the true cycle of life. I study what makes microbes live and function together in communities, and ways to reshape and engineer such communities towards desired functions. I'm specifically interested in microbial communities, also termed microbiomes, that live in gut environments of animals. Why do I do that? Because they affect their hosts and are part of many of the processes that contribute to its well-being. One of my favorite research models is ruminants, like cows and sheep, as they represent the hallmark of host microbiome symbiosis. Ruminants, unlike human beings or mice, cannot live without their microbes. They are totally dependent on their microbiome to digest the plant fiber that they eat, and therefore are the perfect model to study host microbiome symbiosis. Moreover, with the growing world population, ruminants' microbiomes are extremely important to humanity's food security, as they are responsible for producing edible products from indigestible plant material. However, the rumen microbiome is also responsible for the production of large amounts of one of the most potent greenhouse gases, methane, which we all know contributes to global warming. In our studies conducted throughout the planet on thousands of cows, we have discovered that there are natural microbial communities that are responsible for producing less methane and more milk. We are now devising ways to synthetically engineer such communities and to modulate rumen microbiomes across the globe to be more environmentally friendly but still maintain food security for the growing world population. These endeavors will have an immense environmental and agricultural impact. After moving here from the center with my research group and family, we found a very nurturing home here in Bijou, both scientifically and socially. I really never thought that I would be that excited about bacteria. Yeah, isn't that, it's pretty amazing. And I, on a personal note, I have to say that it is researchers like Itzik Mizrahi that convinced me over two and a half years ago to come to Ben Gurion University of the Negev. His passion, his excitement, and his quality, world class, is what gives me the energy, of course, without the gases, right. to come to Ben Gurion University every day with a smile on my face, knowing that we're doing amazing things to change this world. Natasha, I'm sitting here 
And I'm so excited and touched to have had the opportunity to talk to our amazing community of friends and to hear from our amazing community of students and researchers. I believe that it will be the combined work of all of us that will allow BGU to really fulfill the legacy of David Ben-Gurion and to create an Oxford in the desert. All right, well, I'd like to thank you, of course, Danny, and every one of you who have taken time to be with us today. And I promise that at the first opportunity, we're gonna celebrate here on the Marcus campus in Beersheba. Now, we promised you a surprise and we're about to fulfill our promise. In order to keep the sweet taste until next year, please welcome with applause, Brainwash, BGU's faculty band with the song, Let It Be. We're all waiting to be here on the sand of the negative next year. Cloudy. 